I'm Gary Hunter, a marketing professor. I would like to introduce you to strategic marketing uh, and help you learn more about marketing and some of the fundamentals that underlie strategic marketing. Okay, so uh, so pricing, of course, is one of the one of the major uh, variables in the marketing mix. All right. So when you think about pricing, uh, I want to I want to talk about a few different things. I want to talk about the idea of how do you set the price, how do you kind of adapt the price, how do you then initiate and respond to pricing changes, and then a little bit about you know controlled analysis uh, toward the end. That will help you some with the Portland Trail Lake pitch. Okay, so this is why why this slide why this slide here. Yeah, it's, it's part of the marketing mix. So we know that we change something about price. It has effects on all sorts of other things, and whether it's all, all sorts of other things. So it's the other 13 variables that are out there, right? So these other 13 variables are kind of relevant to any changes or things we, we do with the price and sales, right? So price has a lot of labels. So when you think about price, it's all these kind of things like rent, fees, uh, premium, retainers, commissions, all these, all these types of things, bribes, interest, tax. Uh, and it's really kind of getting at the idea of what's the ultimate measure of the assignment of value, right? So price, a lot of times, is called capturing value. Um, this is a concept where people say, okay, this is, this is what we can eat most easily control. When we set that price, uh, then that's basically we've got a price minus our cost, and that's the capturing of value concept, right? So there's a real focus on how to uh, price as capturing value. So I want to talk primarily about six steps in pricing, six basic steps in setting pricing policy. The first is really kind of thinking about determining your objective, and I'll give you some more detail on that. The second then is getting into the idea of demand. How do you determine uh, demand? So how do you kind of forecast demand? The third is really uh, the idea of estimating cost, right? So we're kind of looking at demand and cost, of course, to try to get at a margin, right? Uh, then we're looking at kind of uh, how do we analyze consumer costs, prices, uh, and other offers, uh, I'm sorry, our competitors' costs, prices, and other offers. So we kind of see how do we work versus competitors, whether they're pricing versus competitors. Uh, talk a little bit about selecting a pricing uh, method, and then how do you kind of get to the final price. Okay, so when I say pricing objectives in the first step, what are some of the different pricing objectives that firms find out? Well, the first one, uh, first and foremost, that a lot of companies are trying to do with pricing is to survive. We're just trying to make some money, we're about to go bankrupt. We saw this in uh, the case last week, right? And there's, a, there's, there's sort of this uh, short-term demand. We need some funds to kind of keep the organization alive, and OxyGlobe might be one of the ways we, we can get to that. So these are some of the conditions that often favor that. Intense competition, overcapacity, some of those kind of things can kind of lead to this idea that your objective is just simply survival. survival. A second one might be to maximize your current profit. So that's just kind of a short-term focus. How do we get return on investment? How do we kind of uh, develop some funds and resources? Uh, in the short term. The trade-off a lot of times with your folks is short term, of course, is your long-run performance. A third objective might be to maximize market share. How do we kind of get the uh, market share that we can, we can get? That's often kind of in a market where there's high price in the uh, production <coughs> experience gains. So these are these are gains that are like a kind of scale gains. The experience curve gains is a lot like that. It's just you know you learn things. You know, I heard I heard you guys with this argument last week some. On oxygen again, when you're talking to them about if we do this, we'll learn a lot about how the markets work, and they'll help us kind of do better when we get the team up here. So that's the same kind of argument. Uh, fourth one might be to maximize market skinning. So what's skinning? Uh, we're just going to the top, right? We're just going to try to say who, who's at the top? What defines the top in this case? People who bank the product post, right? So this is, this, the top is basically people where we get the largest margin, right? So we're going to try to skim the top. These are the people who are getting the most, uh, you know, the most out of the product, right? So these are kind of conditions that would favor that. Uh, no huge economy to scale, those, those, those sort of things, right? So achieve and maintain product uh, quality leadership uh, is another objection. So that's oftentimes related, of course, to the company's conditional objective. So those are like five basic things that you can do in terms of your pricing objective. So. Uh, one of the first things to think about in terms of price is quality. So price and quality often kind of come out of the same grids. So it's very common to kind of take price and do a three-way price and say high, medium, and low, and take quality and do a three-way quality thing, low, medium, and high. Uh, so what's this one for? This is a three-by-three price. So this basically kind of gives us a three-by-three. 
And then in each one of these, we can kind of say, well, where are people? We might say there's a value line that's there, right? This is kind of a premium value, medium value, or economy. But all those are kind of on the diagonal, or, or mostly where price and quality kind of map out where you're kind of delivery value. You can any of those spaces. So if I went back to the Marriott example that I talked about earlier, and I have there, so this, this chart is kind of going the other direction, but you can see it's the same idea. If you cross the diagonal, that's where the values are on, they're basically on the value line. You can be up on the value line, so you can kind of go low in terms of price, right? So if you go low in terms of price uh, versus the value line, then you have uh, strategy in the upper uh, right-hand corner for you guys would be super value, right? So that's a super value strategy. And then you just see some of these other ones are just categorically named different ones. If you're way down this area where it's low quality, low price, or low quality, high price, that's the biggest market, and that's called the ripoff strategy, right? <laughs> that's not surprising. But some of these are just kind of assigning names and categorizing. So you, you'll see this a lot in business school if you guys have kind of picked up on it. A lot of times we'll take these continuous variables and make categories out of them. That's all this slide is doing. It's basically just kind of uh, over these categorical areas that are price and quality. And you got to feel for some of the conditions that's there. So this is called the three C's model of price setting. And the three C's model of price setting gets into company costs, competitors, prices, and price of substitutes, and customers assessment of the unique product features. So those are the three C's. On the on the cost side, what the company is paying, that essentially sets the floor uh, for pricing. You you don't sell below that price unless it's a longer term strategy to kind of a cheap market. Penetration, and then we're going to raise the price later. What company gets accused of this kind of pricing strategy a lot? This is a common lawsuit. This company. The strategy I just described is playing this company for a lot. It's like so. No, it's not. It, I haven't heard that they did this, but they're always proud. That's the right scale. You're on the right scale. Oh, it's, it's a retail for what about Walmart. It's Walmart. It's totally Walmart. So Walmart is accused of doing this a lot. They're accused of kind of coming in, uh, you know, in the in the like smaller towns, starting out with like lower prices until they run up all the business and raise the price. So that was, of course, against the law. That's that would be a strategy where you you price and blow your costs, right? So that's uh, that's that's an example. I'm not picking a Walmart. I'm just saying this is sort of you guys. You see some of these things in practice. Okay, so the high, uh, on the high side, there's no possible demand. If the customer can't kind of see that price point, no, no customer sees any price point that, that's kind of the top side. So that sets your, that's basically called the three C's model, cost set the four, demand sets the ceiling. That's kind of the way that works. Okay, so skimming versus penetration pricing, this is an additional skimming, so price and quality is kind of like that. The firm's trying to sell at a high price, uh, and they get those uh, customers that are kind of at the higher end of that market, so you can about this. And this one, this is kind of like pushing down on price, so you're kind of going higher on quantity. So see that you're still playing with the two areas. We talked a lot about the price and quantity, and sure the margin that you're trying to get up. And your costs are kind of set and fixed, and you're using kind of price to kind of set different margins. And then that price is going to have different effects on quantity. Okay, so uh, this this slide, the idea of this slide in terms of determining demand is that you can't always do it straight like this, right? This is a your typical price curve from economics that you've had. So there's there there are going to be products that defy this price curve. <clears throat> what kind of products defy this? Mm -hmm. Where do you see this kind of thing? And what and what we've been talking a lot about that would lead you to believe that there may be categories where there's some association that people have with price and quality. That is a higher price makes me think it's higher quality. What categories work that way? Yeah. Uh, what kind of tables? Luxury. luxury, yeah. So luxury is kind of that way, right? So, you know, if I'm buying a Bentley, you know, and Bentley like it's cheap, what's the point, right? It's supposed to be really pricey. You're trying to price people out of the market, right? Because it's a status kind of a category, right? So luxury products, uh, if you lower your price, you actually may decrease your demand. So you want to see this sometimes they're inversely related, and you want to think about what what are the brand associations that price has on. Um, on some of these different demand slopes, right? So this is part of what you're getting into. So we have to kind of estimate demand. We have to kind of plot it out, right? So estimating cost is looking at fixed costs and variable costs, and you, get, you guys get a lot of this stuff from your finance class and your accounting classes, so that's what that step is. Step four is getting into competitors' pricing. Okay, so what's important here is called parity pricing. 
So parity pricing is where you're looking at uh, where where is our product price, where is our competitive product price, and you're kind of trying to map out where those competitors price, not competitive products are priced. Okay, so that's also on a price quality. If you're competing in the same price quality quadrant or the same price quality uh, area, because you're not trying to achieve parity with like low rates. So when I was talking earlier about, uh, you can think about these three different categories, brand loyal segments, a lot of areas, right? What's the middle segment? Switcher, right? What's the low segment? Price matches, right? So, so, so you're, you're always, you're, uh, so pairing the pricing versus other people are competing in the same space. You're, you know, if you're competing kind of in the brand loyal space, you're trying to achieve parity pricing versus other companies that are competing or other brands that are competing in the, in that upper end brand loyal space, right? If you're in the price conscious and you're trying to get parity pricing with them, which basically means, I go back to the bottle of water example earlier, right? If you've got a 16 ounce bottle of water, if you're in the brand loyal space, there's a brand loyal bottle of water, what space is that? See, see how well you guys do that. Smart water? They might be, yes, yeah, smart water is pretty close. But I was thinking the entire boss. Boss. Uh, boss. Okay, so I was thinking more Edion. There you go to Edion. What's, what's Edion's go back from? Naive. Naive. Very good. Okay, so Edion is very much sort of, so that's, that's what you're doing. That, so when you're thinking about these categories, you're in that space. What about the. Uh, the sign, I think the brand loyal, where do you guys think they probably are? They're probably switchers, right? They're probably kind of in the switcher category, so if I get a better deal on another brand that's kind of in this space, I might go for that. And then uh, with bottles of water packaging, I found that's a pretty good indicator of where they are. That's a Nestle bottle, but I know that, I know that bottle, I know the uh, packaging on it is weaker than this packaging, right? <laughs> so that's a Nestle and stuff like that. You'll see those 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 are still brand. That's a high end brand. This is a high end brand. Uh, but it's um so it's probably operating switchers, but when you start getting to the bottles that are like that, to me that feels more price conscious. That's all the price conscious ones are gonna go like the more flimsy packaging and stuff like that, right? So you so those are the kind of areas. So you're trying to achieve parity on 16 ounce bottles versus other people that are operating the same price bottles. Quite a bit of Are switchers in a favorite category or all the categories different products? Yeah, it depends on the product. So it kind of depends on the product and the competition. So that's just a generic way of thinking about, you know, it's not always broken down like 33% of each one or anything like that, right? So some category is going to have more brand oil, uh, folks. some are going to have more switchers, some are going to have more price conscious. But it's just kind of a generic way of thinking about that. Uh, that's, that's again, this kind of overlay on that price quality grid that I had earlier. About pricing that. So the fifth step is kind of selecting a method. Okay, so methods are things like cost based pricing. Uh, so that's, that, that's really a, that's what it sounds like it is cost based pricing. It's kind of saying, what are my total costs? What it cost me to kind of make this product? I'm going to add some markup to that cost. Uh, and then the other, the other major one is value-based pricing. Right, value-based pricing uh, has a lot of implications in the way you do pricing. So you want to know the difference in cost-based pricing and value-based pricing. Uh, because in uh, the development stage, we're going to talk about before you get into the product life cycle. Uh, if you do market-based pricing, that's basically kind of looking at what the market would end up paying for a product if you did make the product. So market-based uh, pricing becomes, or value-based pricing becomes really important because instead of like going all the way to the stage of Making the product, you decide is there a market for the product before you go out, uh, go out and go for it. And the other one is called going rate pricing. Who does a lot of going rate pricing? Airline. Uh, what, what buyer buys a lot on going rate? Commodity markets. Airfare. You guys are close. Okay, so like this. Is, uh, so I'll tell you the one the one that makes me feel think about when I think about competitive base pricing. Uh, and the way they typically work is say these are the specs. This is the specs that this product needs to work at. Uh, what we're trying to do is uh, we're going to go with the company that gives us the lowest bid for these specs, right? Uh, so um, my experience with, uh, with uh, was with the Army, right? And the uh, competitive-based pricing product that I thought about the most was a parachute. The first time I jumped with one, because <laughs> it was basically like a chute that's built by the lowest cost provider, right? It's sort of like that's not what you're looking for in a parachute necessarily as a consumer. But the government does a lot of like spec-based pricing, so that's what you're doing a lot of times you're doing 
you know, that, that kind of stuff, right? So cost-based pricing versus value-based pricing are the two basically that you want to think about in terms of the difference from those. So if you look at cost-based pricing, you're just calculating the cost plus, and on the value side, you're kind of calculating it based on perception that customers have or consumers have of what the product might be working. Okay, so that really brings you into this, this slide. So this slide's a bad slide. So all those concepts kind of build into this. Uh, you can kind of see how this builds into the idea of, uh, of this slide. Uh, but the major part of the major build that this slide has versus what we talked about at this point, we talked kind of the, uh, the idea of perceived value and the way people think about it being kind of the value-based price. The value and exchange uh, is kind of uh, beyond that. But the main part here, the main build, is the value of use. Okay, so value and use, uh, and I may have talked, I may have talked this a little bit, but uh, uh, so many, a lot of you guys are engineers, right? So I like to take, I like to talk about value and use uh, based on this uh, notion of like driving steel beams in the ground. So, like, give you guys this example before. Okay, we have talked about driving steel beams. Okay, so uh, if, if I'm like building buildings and stuff like that, right? I'm going to build a new building or civil engineering kind of guy. How many of you guys are civil engineers? Okay, so when I drive these uh, beams to the ground, right, uh, I, I've got to bring this big construction uh, device to drive a steel beam into the ground. What's that? What's the, you know what that device is called? It hammers it into the ground? Pile driver? Pile driver. That's totally a pile driver. You guys have heard about pile driver before. These things actually exist, right? So if I'm going to drive this beam into the ground, I've got this pile driver to drive the beam into the ground that will build my building around this, these beams that I'm driving into the ground. Between the hammer and the beam, the top of the beam, I'm going to put a pad there, right? That pad, if I put that pad between the hammer and the beam, why do I, why do, I do that? To keep from damaging the, the impacts, will keep from damaging the ends of it. Yeah, good. So I don't want to damage either the beam or the handle, right? So the pad kind of helps diffuse this, so it kind of presses it down and pushes it into the ground. Okay, so I can design that pad in different ways, right? If I take that pad and I make that pad a really good pad that's durable and lasts a long time versus one that's not very durable, how does the person who's the construction company get value out of the durable pad? What are some of the, what are some of the, yeah, value and use, but how does that value and use work? What are some ways they get value out of it? By lasting longer, what is it? What you, you don't have downtime. You don't have downtime. Okay, so you don't have downtime, so you don't have to pay the guy who's operating the pile driver, right? The, the construction guy who's on there. Who else do you not have to pay? Acquisition costs, transportation. Yeah, yeah. replacing it. You don't have to pay for replacing it as much, right? So you, so you start getting all these costs, and you start adding up. Well, what do those costs add up to? That's the idea of value and use. So value and use is much more kind of a business to business. Uh, concept, right? You get it much more business to business. You hear it a lot on the consumer market, but you hear it a lot on the consumer market on more environmental products. It's a big thing on like total economic value. So if you guys look at like electric cars, do you guys talk about electric cars? Does anybody about to drive an electric car? Can you park like inside the building? Yeah. <laughs> you can park inside the building. But how does value and use work for an electric car? Too much like gas. Charge. Yeah, so yeah, you can charge, but what, how do you get more use? You pay more for it up front, right? So, so you got to have some kind of idea that says you're going to have some value the longer you use it. So where do you, how do you start getting some of that money back? It lasts tax credit. You might get the tax credit, how else? Um, if you drive the Tesla, you get the energy for free. You get the energy, oh, right, they, they don't, they don't, so they'll they actually pay for the energy. I mean, so you don't have any energy costs at all, right? So that's like totally eliminated. I think it, it will uh, drop when more electric cars are coming to the market, but if you're not here, parking garage, you get it also. Yeah, so if I did my estimates, if I'm just comparing ener energy dollars, well, that's a good term, right? So I'm comparing energy dollars for a Tesla or even another electrical car versus a gas operating car, how does that flow? It's a lot less, right? So it's, it's a lot less. So I'm not going to get that value back until I've driven the car a certain period of time. Right? That's that's what value and use is getting at. So you guys have totally got it, right? That's totally the way you get it in terms of like pile drivers and the way you get it in terms of electric cars. So that's what this that's what this slide is trying to get at. When you're looking at different types of value, you want to think beyond just kind of like economic value and think about things like value and use. Okay, the. Um, 
the gist of cost-based pricing is really just to add a markup, what if you calculate your total cost and add some markup to that. This is an example of how cost-based pricing would work. There's nothing really much to it, right? This is kind of going through the channels. So you've got a producer with a markup, a wholesaler with a markup, a retailer with a markup. So you start seeing like how it kind of breaks out in terms of cost. Uh, so uh, you might have some, this is giving you some different assumptions. You might not calculate markup price and stuff like that. That's all about that uh, so, you, so you look at different costs throughout the, the value chain to see like who's making different money across different areas, who's making the most markup. This is often driven by who has power within the channel. You know, as you get into the play period, we'll talk more about who has power within the channel. If the retailer has more power, the retailer takes more margin. That's kind of typical, you know, on this, these kind of cost-based pricing trees, you kind of see it. And these, you kind of do like break-even charts. Some of you guys did break-even analysis and break-even charts on the last case that you calculated as well. So that's kind of straightforward. Okay, so the gist of value-based pricing is looking at it differently. It's kind of going out to the market and saying how much would the market pay, and then estimating back from kind of what the market would pay for the product, uh, and basing your pricing based on what the market would pay not so much on what it would cost. So this slide gets into that. Mr. Monitor told me about that. <coughs> so here you're doing the same thing with price. You can see that product price, think of that as a lever that you move up and down and it affects on the other side. These different uh, uh, costs that are associated with the firm incentive to sell and the customer's incentive to sell. And then you can see the concept overlay from the previous slide, value and use, value and exchange. So that's kind of the way you think about this is a monitor is a good way of thinking about a lot of the pricing issues that go on, right? This is just getting at consumer perceptions of price, competitive based pricing or going rate. I talked some about that. The concept of reference pricing we covered uh, in biofuel, so that's kind of like how the different prices that exist affect the price that you're going to have. So that's the question of does the price of oxygen flow affect the Another reference price example. I don't think I have another slide. So the sixth one is just getting into different types of pricing. So psychological pricing are things like price points. Sometimes consumers will have a middle block about going to the next price point or going to both different levels. This is why you see like the 99s and the 97s. Because people think 99 is a lot less than the even dollar. That's all driven by psychological pricing kind of ideas. Uh, that's, that's, and that's basically the sixth step. Okay, so this is going to get into like different ways you can kind of customize price. Those are some different uh, areas where you're customizing price. These are different concepts. You guys know what loss leader pricing is? <coughs> so loss leader is often used to like bring people in and sort of say you use loss leader on the price of gas. They'll put the price out to try to have the lowest on regular gasoline, right? Uh, the idea is that you're going to pull in and buy what? Cigarettes, beer, or something else, right? Not just like gas. Right? Because you just buy the gas, that's that's not gonna work in their favor. So loss leader pricing is often to kind of drive traffic in. Here we go at the lowest price and then we kind of hope you buy something else. And you make a margin on the basket of other prices that you buy. I don't know if you guys if anybody drive a car that requires premium gas. They really play with that something they have millions. Like the loss leader stuff that you know it's really hard to know your premium price when you're in it and stuff like that. So it's like a really different kind of a deal. Nobody puts premium price much out there, but it's just a regular price that's out there. And kind of premium later. This chart is just about how do you adapt prices. So it's getting into conventional wisdom. A lot of firms have different uh, charts that help them with this. So the first question is how do you respond to these competitors' price changes? Uh, if they cut their price, is it likely to be significantly hurt your sales? If the answer is no, you don't do anything. If the answer is yes, you ask the question, do the firm of cuts, or are they going to kind of stick there? If the answer to that is no, you probably don't do anything. You just kind of write it out super early if it's been cut. Currently, then you uh, might want to ask, how much is that cut, right? If it's less than 2%, this would be the chart on what you do with that. You put a cents off coupon, uh, drop uh, price by half, uh, by more than 4%, and you drop the price to the competitor price. So this is just an example of like a flow chart that, would, that companies would use to try to make decisions about what we do when our competitor makes changes. And your flow charts and your pricing and terms is the kind of firm, firm, category, category, in terms of how you do this parity pricing question, right? 
this is kind of key to know is that like price wars are kind of a big thing that companies are often trying to avoid. And uh, one of the common tactics in avoiding a price war is to create a buyer brand. So that's basically just a brand that you kind of put out there. And that brand kind of uh, competes against the price conscious consumer, right? Uh, so you're trying to keep your brand loyal consumer, or if you're a switcher, you're trying to keep your switcher category. And you're moving your buyer brand out to fight for like space versus the price conscious consumers. So you'll see that a lot uh, in terms of different tactics. All the best with your efforts to master marketing and sales. I'm Gary Hunter, and I hope you have a great day.